Our story begins with a seemingly ordinary day in South Korea, where martial artists exist, but remain hidden from the general public's awareness. Among these martial artists, some have mastered their skills to maintain order in the region. Our protagonist, Kong Hai Jin, an 18-year-old student working as a cashier, had no idea of the hidden world of martial arts until a peculiar encounter. It all started when, 12 hours ago, at Cheonha High School, students gathered in a nearby alley. A man forcefully positioned his arms and exclaimed, Hyuk Cheon Divine Arts, before delivering a powerful punch to our unsuspecting protagonist's stomach. Confused and in pain, Hygiene couldn't help but wonder what this divine arts nonsense was all about. The man's friend found the situation amusing and questioned the purpose of all this talk about divine arts when they could simply demand money from Hygiene. The man responded by asking his friend if he watched Hyuk Cheon Divine Fist, claiming that becoming a fan of the Hyuk Cheon sect was inevitable. While Hygiene still knelt on the ground, Nursing his aching stomach, he chimed in, admitting that he found Hyuk Cheon Divine Arts intriguing, but nearly missed out on the excitement due to a lack of money. Undeterred by the bullies, Hygiene expressed his belief that fighting in real life was an exaggeration, and if they tried to imitate such moves, they'd be swiftly defeated by real MMA fighters. In response, the man punched Hygiene in the face, leaving him sprawled on the ground. The man then questioned whether Hygiene had been watching YouTube videos that had suddenly made him stronger. Hygiene's torment continued as the man angrily kicked him while berating him as a dirty poor orphan who should act accordingly. The situation took an unexpected turn when someone called out to the man, causing him to turn around in confusion. A woman named Wu Ahan confronted the man, demanding that he stop blocking the way. The man questioned her sanity and warned her to find another path if she wanted to avoid getting hurt. However, the man's friend intervened informing him that the lady was a Han. Just as tensions escalated, another man, Wang Taisong, appeared behind a Han and asked what the troublemakers were saying to her. Wang Taisong reminded them that he had warned them not to bully the kids. In an agitated tone, Taisong offered to handle the situation himself if they preferred. The man's friend promptly apologized to Taisong, explaining that his friend had gotten carried away. Taisong accepted the apology, and the bullies decided to back off, retreating from the scene. With the bullies gone, Taisong turned to Ahan, asking if she was unharmed. He suggested that they visit the infirmary together, just to be safe. And Hyjin couldn't help but feel grateful for the unexpected allies who had come to his rescue in this mysterious world of martial arts. As Taisong offered his assistance and asked if Hyjin was alright, Hyjin expressed his gratitude and assured him that he was fine. Ahan, on the other hand, insisted that she didn't need any help and explained that it would have been over if Hyjin had just taken the hits. She believed that sometimes it was necessary to lower one's head, even if it seemed cruel, to avoid making situations worse. While they continued walking together, Taisong inquired if Ahan had any time after school today, but she regretfully replied that she was busy. This left Taisong alone, feeling a surge of frustration. He couldn't understand why he should bow down to those bullies, even though he lacked financial resources. His anger bubbled up, and he shouted at the retreating bullies to mind their own business. Given his current financial struggles, Hajin had been working tirelessly at a part-time job and even joined an MMA gym. He believed that with more training, he could eventually defeat the bullies. However, his world took an unexpected turn when his coach advised him to stop. Confused, Hajin asked why, and his coach explained that despite his efforts for over six months, his body hadn't shown any signs of improvement. It was as if his body refused to change from its current state. His coach placed a hand on Hajin's shoulder, sympathizing with his situation and offering to refund his lesson fees. Hajin, however, refused to give up and clung to his coach's hand. He couldn't accept the idea that in this world, some efforts went unrewarded, even if it meant struggling against his body's resistance. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What is the best type of martial arts? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. Later, in a convenience store, Hajin was diligently arranging the stock. As he worked, he reflected on the idea that sometimes the one teaching gives up first, Success is all about perseverance. He had learned his training routine well enough to continue it on his own without incurring any additional expenses. In fact, he thought it might be even better this way. Realizing there were currently no customers, Hygiene grabbed a nearby basket. He decided that if he squeezed in some exercise between his shifts, he could potentially manage an extra shift. Determined to begin, he opted for one set of deadlifts. He lifted the basket repetitively while counting, but when he reached four, a sudden pain jolted through his body, causing him to cry out in agony. He found himself on the floor, writhing in pain. He couldn't help but wonder if he needed to start taking vitamins or something for his health. Amidst his discomfort, 
Hajin overheard someone calling another person a crazy bastard and demanding to know what they were doing. The man apologized and explained that he had seen an old man and suspected him of theft. His friend checked the old man's belongings, but the old man insisted he had done nothing wrong and asked to be released. Ignoring the old man's pleas, the man struck him in the face while his friend urged him to move on. The man then complained about needing what he had taken and being particularly angry that day. He asked his friend if they should continue beating the old man until he felt better. The old man trembled in fear, apologizing and begging them not to hurt him any further. Suddenly, Ha Jin couldn't stand by any longer. He shouted that it was the convenience store at some branch and that two men were assaulting an old man, pretending to call the police. Ha Jin surprised the assailants, causing one of them to exclaim that the police were coming and that they should flee. One of the men threatened they would meet again before making their hasty escape. Approaching the shaken old man, Hajin asked if he was all right. The old man inquired if he had called the police, to which Hajin replied that he hadn't actually called them, as he didn't want to deal with the inconvenience it might bring. He extended a helping hand to the old man, who expressed gratitude for Hajin's assistance, despite it having nothing to do with him. Hajin assured the old man not to worry, and explained that he couldn't stand by when bullies targeted easy victims. Noticing the old man's trembling leg, he realized that the thugs had been specifically targeting his weakness. Intrigued by the old man's bizarre questions, Hajin found himself caught up in a peculiar conversation. Despite his initial confusion, he decided to play along and hoped to send the old man on his way eventually. Hajin asked the old man why someone so remarkable was wandering around like this. The old man responded by revealing a hidden world of martial arts factions in South Korea. He described three major factions, the King Company, which controlled the underworld using martial arts, the Shin Shin Religion, a new religious group following God as their leader, and EMP, an unofficial government organization known as Emperor, responsible for monitoring and controlling martial arts matters. These three powerful factions had joined forces to suppress smaller martial arts groups. The old man had once resisted alongside other factions, but had been relentlessly pursued for over a decade barely escaping with his life. He explained his caution earlier when discussing calling the police, as it might draw the attention of EMP, potentially causing trouble. Hajin, growing frustrated with the old man's delusions, questioned whether it was appropriate to share such sensitive information with someone who was encountering it for the first time. However, the old man persisted in asking about Hajin's parents. Hajin, now irritated, replied that he didn't know his parents because they had passed away when he was just a baby demanding to know why the old man kept probing him. The old man then activated his power, touching his chest, and revealed that Hajin's meridians were blocked. Hajin, baffled, asked what meridians were, and the old man explained that they were the paths through which ki flowed inside the body. Even an ordinary person had some open meridians, but Hajin's were completely blocked from the outside, preventing his body from growing as it should. The old man warned Hajin, that with his meridians blocked, he was merely stressing his body, and that even minor exercise could cause severe pain. If he continued this way, his kai would flow in reverse, leading to his death. The old man suggested that some efforts were better left undone, and urged Hajin to give up and look for another path. Hajin, frustrated and defiant, recounted hearing similar advice from various people throughout the day. He acknowledged his lack of talent in fighting, but declared his determination to become stronger and defeat his adversaries. He believed no one had the right to stop him, he would do whatever it took to achieve his goal. The old man remained silent, looking at his injured hand. When Hajin calmed down, he realized the futility of arguing with a homeless man and told him to go to the hospital if he couldn't bear it. However, the old man suddenly grabbed his arm and pulled him, leaving Hajin in a state of panic. Desperate to understand the old man's intentions, Hajin asked what he was doing. The old man explained that he had witnessed countless people like Hajin who pushed themselves to the brink of self-destruction. He held Hajin's hand, expressing his belief that if left unchecked, Hajin would continue down this dangerous path. Then, against Hajin's protests, the old man proceeded to open his meridians. After a brief moment, the old man appeared tired, but assured Hajin that it was done. He turned away, mentioning that it had been a while since he used his kai and walked out of the convenience store. He left Hajin stunned and bewildered, wondering about the mysterious events that had just transpired. A few hours later, the convenience store owner thanked Hajin for his help, and the owner expressed sympathy for what Hajin had been through. As he walked down the street, he contemplated the strange turn of events. He couldn't help but think that the world was vast and filled with its share of eccentric individuals. The concept of meridians sounded like something out of a martial arts webcomic, but he was living in the 21st century, so it all seemed nonsensical. He wondered how he had ended up in such a bizarre situation. 
getting beaten up without doing anything to provoke it. Suddenly, someone placed an arm on his shoulder, jolting him with surprise. It was the same man from earlier who had threatened to meet again. The man told Hygiene to wait, because things would be over soon. He taunted Hygiene, referring to him as a nerd who enjoyed living righteously. The man confessed that he found it amusing to exploit people like Hygiene. Hygiene reacted swiftly, grabbing one of the man's fingers and snapping it, causing the man to cry out in pain. The man's friend questioned what had just happened, and the injured man explained that his finger was broken. The man continued to tease Hygiene for complaining about a single broken finger, and mocked him for not knowing how to have fun. In the midst of this confrontation, the man lunged at Hygiene in anger. However, Hygiene stayed composed, carefully watching the man's movements. He plahan to strike when the man entered his range. As the man drew nearer, Hygiene readied his fist for an attack, but then he felt something strange inside his body, leaving him bewildered and uncertain about what was happening. Despite the confusion, Hygiene launched a powerful fist, surprising both the man and himself, as it struck the man with tremendous force sending him crashing into the wall. The shockwave also affected the man's friend, who fell to the ground. Moments later, Hygiene found himself staring at the collapsed men and the destruction of his uniform and arm. He was utterly perplexed. Suddenly, a voice broke the silence, and Hygiene realized it was the homeless old man from earlier. He questioned why he couldn't move his body, but the old man posed a question in return, asking if Hygiene now believed in the existence of Ki or martial arts. The old man released a green smoke that enveloped him as he walked past Hajin. He cryptically commented that Hajin was still inexperienced, but assured him it was only natural. This left Hajin in a state of wonder, pondering the true nature of the old man's abilities and the mysterious green smoke surrounding him. As Park Jong-un, the leader of the Beggar Union, introduced himself to Hajin, Hajin struggled to speak and slowly explained that his body wasn't moving. He then fell into a state of exhaustion. Fortunately, Jang-un caught him in time and reassured him that he had simply expended too much ki at once. Jang-un advised Hajin to take a nap, assuring him that he would be fine. Jang-un inquired about Hajin's home and offered to take him there. Hajin replied that he lived alone and there was nothing valuable to steal from his home. Suddenly, Hajin yelped in pain as something hit his butt. Jang-un explained that it was an acupuncture point and asked how he felt. Hajin, still in discomfort, apologized to Jang-un for his earlier outburst. Jang-un couldn't help but be impressed by the power he had witnessed from Hajin, considering it had been only a few hours since he had opened Hajin's meridians. He believed that Hajin might have more potential than he had initially thought. The next day in the alley, a crowd had gathered, laughing heartily as they saw the two men from the previous night, still in the same position with their clothes in tatters, sound asleep. People jokingly questioned if they had passed out from excessive drinking, finding the sight amusing. Some even likened it to a sacred ritual where they prayed while lying down. Amid the crowd, Ahan and her friend observed the scene. Ahan suggested to her friend that they should leave since they were running late for school. However, Ahan noticed something peculiar about the sleeping men and wondered what it could be. As she contemplated this, a man approached the sleeping figures, and another man suddenly appeared behind Ahan and her friend leaving them in shock. The man who approached the sleeping men walked past them, requesting that they allow him to pass through for a moment. Ahan's friend, annoyed by the intrusion, questioned who the imposing individual was. Ahan closely observed the man, looking back and forth between him and the sleeping men. She noticed more people in suits nearby, which added to her curiosity. Meanwhile, in Hygiene's house, he dreamt about the events of the previous night, the powerful punch he had delivered his inability to move his body, and the introduction of the old man as Park jong -un. He woke up in shock, shouting that it was the uncle, but to his surprise, he found no one in the room. Hajin got out of bed wondering if jong -un had left after dropping him off the night before. However, his vision became blurry, and he felt an overwhelming pain coursing through his entire body. It was so intense that it felt like his heart might burst. He struggled to comprehend what was happening and noted that his whole body ached. He realized it was not just his leg, but his entire body that was in pain. He couldn't fathom why he felt this way. Hajin looked around his room, wondering if he was still dreaming, and why his body felt so sore. He reached out to touch his body, hoping to confirm that it wasn't a dream. To his astonishment, he could feel the power within him, and he noticed that his muscles were developing. However, this newfound strength was not the immediate concern. Suddenly, a blue smoke emerged from his ears, further bewildering and panicking him. He questioned what it was, covering his ears in alarm. Someone told him it was called Ki and instructed him to stop making a fuss so early in the morning. The person added that they would explain it to him and Hajin should sit down. jong -un gave him a serious look, but Hajin couldn't contain his excitement and ran toward jong -un, shouting about what he had done while he was asleep. jong -un marveled at Hajin's muscles, asking how they had grown so quickly. He checked Hajin's condition 
and reassured him that his blood flow was stable, so there was nothing to worry about. Hajin questioned whether Jung-Goon had caused this transformation while he was sleeping, but Jung-Goon simply asked if Hajin hadn't noticed him returning just now. He explained that he hadn't done anything to Hajin since yesterday evening. Hajin flexed his muscles asking what it all meant. Jung-Goon observed Hajin's thick muscles and explained that once the meridians were unblocked and Kai began to flow, the body started to change. He clarified that the appearance was not something he had created. Rather, it was Hajin's hard work and dedication that had led to these results. Jung-Goon was surprised to note that Hajin had grown 20 centimeters taller since the previous day. Hajin bashfully acknowledged this and asked Jung-Goon where he had gotten the clothes he was wearing. Jung-Goon mentioned that he had obtained them from the mess he had created the previous night and had gone to clean up the traces. He reminded Hai Jin that he had warned him about being tracked down by the King Company, the Xinxin Religion, or EMP, if he left such a conspicuous trail behind. Jung Goon advised Hai Jin to hide his body for a while, explaining that since he couldn't yet control his key, he would leave traces everywhere, making it only a matter of time before he was chased down by those factions. Hai Jin, feeling increasingly panicky about the strange phenomenon with the blue smoke, suggested covering his ears with something like earphones. However, the blue smoke suddenly started to come out of his nose, causing him even more distress. He told jong -un that he would cover his nose too, but then he noticed the smoke leaking from his pants. This realization left jong -un looking at him with a mixture of disgust and concern. jong -un assured Hajin that he would assist him in mastering complete control over his key. He explained that he, as the general, would take on this responsibility. Hajin was perplexed by the title general, and he questioned jong -un about it. jong -un explained that next to the king and god, an emperor holds the title of general. Meanwhile, in a flashback to 1962 in Seoul, the leader of the beggar union, Kim Ju Bong, gathered his followers and addressed them. He emphasized that the world was undergoing significant changes, and their union needed to adapt to a new culture and be reborn. To signify this transformation, Ju Bong declared that he would change his title from leader to general. The beggars were initially stunned, but then cheered Ju Bong, praising him for being ahead of the norm. They asked him why he made this decision, and Ju Bong modestly replied that there was depth to his choice, though in truth, he had seen the idea in a newspaper. On the other hand, Hua San, the clan leader, was shocked to learn about Ju Bong's decision to change his title to general. He instructed one of his men to speak English, as he believed it sounded cool. When the man mentioned volcano as the English word, Hua San adopted it as his new title, proclaiming that everyone should call him Chief Volcano. Meanwhile, other clan leaders were similarly surprised to hear about the changes in titles, such as general, volcano, shaman, and ocean among their fellow leaders. jong -un explained to Hai-jin that the strange tradition they were following was an important part of their practice. Hai-jin, though puzzled, decided to follow along. jong -un got up and urged Hai-jin to move slowly, prompting Hai-jin to ask where they were headed. However, he suddenly remembered that he had to attend school and inquired about the time. Before jong -un could respond, he unexpectedly attacked Hai-jin. When Hai-jin regained consciousness, he found himself disoriented and realized he was not in his own room. Panic set in as he recalled the attack by jong -un. Someone nearby urged him to get up, explaining that they were in one of the secret hideouts of the Beggar Union, a clandestine organization known only to a select few. Confused, Hajin turned to jong -un for answers. jong -un reminded him of their earlier conversation that morning, when he had promised to help Hajin gain full control over his Kai. However, jong -un added a grim condition. If Hajin couldn't achieve mastery, he would be forever confined to this hidden sanctuary. Meanwhile, outside, a woman in a suit indulged in her meal, singing praises of Taisong's greatness. She shared with a man that finding martial artists without any leads had proven challenging. Curious about how Nam Gung had assigned them these tasks, she lamented the passing of the old days. The man reminded her that those days were long gone, and they had to accept their current reality. She then brought up Yam Jong Gun Jin and the death penalty, seeking the man's opinion as she saw parallels with martial arts. He explained that no traces of energy had been found in the alley, making it unlikely that someone used their key recklessly, especially an inexperienced martial artist. She wondered why they hadn't been caught, and also inquired about the whereabouts of the old man general. Two months later in the sewer, a potent blue smoke enveloped the surroundings. jong -un watched from a distance, instructing Hajin to completely conceal his aura. Inside a room, Hajin sweatily complied, gradually concealing his blue smoke aura. Then jong -un ordered him to fully release it, and Hajin unleashed a powerful aura that shook the sewer, even causing a nearby lamp to explode. Acknowledging Hajin's impressive Kai control, jong -un admitted there was nothing more he could teach him. Hajin eagerly asked if he could leave, expressing his frustration at being kept in the sewer for a month, enduring grueling training, 
and strange tasks like eating mice and cockroaches. He worried about losing his part-time job and his salary. As Jong Goon approached, he grabbed Hai Jin's neck and questioned his audacious tone. In pain, Hai Jin inquired about a tap. Eventually, Hai Jin stood up, holding his neck, and announced he had to go to school, as the situation was becoming risky if he didn't. Jung Goon, curious about Hai Jin's sudden need to go to school, questioned if it was to catch up on his delayed curriculum or if there was another motive. Hai Jin, unaware that Jung Goon was behind him, claimed he had to attend the university. In response, Jung Goon firmly pressed his shoulder gripping his head and accused him of telling obvious lies. Hajin insisted he was serious and pleaded for a break. jung -gun finally let go, allowing Hajin to fall to the ground and warned him not to forget their agreement. Hajin assured him that he wouldn't use his skills and that he could handle his adversaries without them. Later, in an alley near Chiona High School, the same man punched a smaller student, all while boasting about his martial arts prowess. His friend questioned when he would quit, but the man dismissed him asking about cookies instead. His friend lamented the lack of fun in fighting lately, noting that at least it had been enjoyable to beat up the new guy. Looking at the new student's wallet, the man agreed, mentioning that they had trained hard and it had been more enjoyable. His friend asked if he was okay with getting caught out of fear. Suddenly, someone interrupted, asking what they meant by caught and remarking that they were still doing the same thing after two months. This left the beaten up new student bewildered. The man told him that he had grown a bit taller and his friend playfully referred to him as a tiger, joking about how it understood their conversation. The man welcomed the newcomer back and suggested they spar using Haikchion style, but the new student punched him in the face, causing his nose to bleed and knocking him to the ground. He sat there, exasperated, and approached the man's friend, questioning if that was really how the Hukkion clan's techniques were supposed to be executed. He remarked that webtoons were just webtoons, as there seemed to be too many unnecessary movements when applied in real life. This realization left the man panicking and wondering about hygiene and whether he truly was Kung Hygiene. The new student asked the man if he was coming out or if he needed to come in. He menacingly positioned his hands, causing panic in the man who pleaded for him to wait. Ignoring the plea, he swiftly punched the man in the chest, causing him to cry out in pain and collapse to the ground. He remarked that it was simpler than he had expected and picked up the wallet, accusing those guys of picking fights with individuals they perceived as weaker. He tossed the wallet back to the new student and confirmed it was his, instructing him not to worry about the situation or mention it to the teachers. He urged the man to leave quickly, and the man immediately fled while expressing his gratitude. Looking at the fleeing man, he felt satisfied for catching the troublemakers, but wondered about the next steps. He considered hiding them somewhere, but suddenly someone appeared and asked what had happened, catching him by surprise. Ahan questioned if he was Haijin and inquired about the situation. Meanwhile, in an apartment building, jong stretched and appreciated being outside, enjoying the fresh air. He briefly contemplated stopping Hai Jin, even if it meant forcibly restraining him. However, he couldn't forget Hon's determined face, realizing that it wouldn't have been that easy for Hai Jin to survive all these challenges. Recognizing that Hai Jin was still his disciple, he resolved to help him with his current predicament. On the rooftop, people in suits burst in. The lady informed her senior that General ES had escaped overseas. However, Jung Goon intervened, referring to them as the younglings of Nam Gung, surprising them. The lady shouted, demanding to know why the general was there. The man ordered them to prepare for battle, but Jung Goon calmly mentioned that they had caused quite a commotion. As he looked at them, he released a potent aura, causing them to step back and shield themselves. While emanating this powerful aura, he inquired if they were on good terms with King. He also inquired if being under King was worthwhile, but the man simply stared at him. Suddenly, group of men stormed inside, seeking guidance from their team leader. They were taken aback to see the general, but Jang Goon pretended to be shocked by the sudden influx of people. The team leader swiftly leaped into action, hurling his sword towards Jang Goon and executing the heavenly sword technique, Heaven Slash, which unleashed a flurry of slashes breaking through the wall. Despite the commotion, Jang Goon calmly acknowledged that it seemed worthwhile and that he had indeed grown stronger during his absence. The team leader ordered his subordinates to request support from headquarters, the lady instructed the man beside her to do so. The man reached for his phone in his coat pocket, but Jung Gun used his cane to crush the man's hand, shattering the phone. The man was flung aside and Jung Gun scolded him, indicating that it wasn't enough. The man slammed onto the ground, leaving both the team leader and the lady shocked. The team leader was amazed as Jung Gun swiftly moved away with a single leap, heading toward the executioner. Other men surrounded Jung Gun, and he informed them that he was getting old and not as formidable as he used to be. He warned that if the confrontation continued, it would become a hassle. The lady fumed at his words, and the team leader glared angrily. Jung Gun playfully twirled his cane and urged them to consider the old man 
cheekily asking them to be gentle. The men charged forward to attack him simultaneously, but Zhang Gun firmly grasped his cane with both hands and plunged it into the ground, releasing a powerful force that created a massive explosion. Meanwhile, in the alley, Hygiene nervously asked Ahan what she was talking about, but she remained silent, making him uneasy. Taisong excitedly called out to Ahan, explaining that he had rushed to reprimand the troublemakers but fell silent when he noticed Ahan's attention on the sweating Hygiene. Taisong then turned his gaze towards Hygiene and inquired if he was Kong Hygiene. This made Hygiene realize he had overreacted and should have assessed his surroundings first. Hygiene admitted it had been a while since they had seen each other, roughly two months. Taisong acknowledged this mentioning Hyjin had been ill, but noting other changes in him during that time. Hyjin nervously conceded that he had changed a bit and mentioned switching gyms recently, praising the new place and the progress he had made with his body. Ahan looked at Hyjin with suspicion in her eyes and questioned whether he was truly telling the truth. Hyjin, sweating nervously, insisted that he was being honest and admitted that he should have gone to see the teacher first. He quickly excused himself, promising to visit the teacher's room and discuss matters later. With a hasty departure, he left the bully's unconscious body behind in the alley. As they listened to Hajin calling the teachers to inform them of his return after two months and inquiring about their whereabouts, Taisung remarked to Ahan that the world was indeed full of surprises. However, Ahan remained silent, her gaze fixed on the bully sprawled on the ground. Moments later, inside the teacher's room, a concerned teacher asked Hygiene how he was feeling. The teacher acknowledged the two-month absence and emphasized that there would be a significant gap in his learning progress. He encouraged Hygiene to work hard to catch up. Gratefully, Hygiene replied in the affirmative and expressed his thanks to the teacher. Following the conversation, the teacher instructed Hygiene to head to class and not to skip any more lessons, to which Hygiene agreed. Walking through the corridor, Hygiene felt relieved that his homeroom teacher didn't pay much attention to him. He realized that he should have been more cautious, as his master had advised. Reflecting on his calloused hands, he remembered Zhang Gun's warning about the extensive surveillance networks deployed by the king, god, and the emperor to track unaffiliated martial artists. If they discovered that he could write records, he could be captured, killed, or enslaved. Hajin clenched his hand, pondering how he had managed not to stand out when his body had undergone such significant changes in just two months. He berated himself for insisting on coming out on his own. Putting on his jacket, he decided to blend in as much as possible, even if he wasn't sure if it would work. In the classroom, he sat in the back, wondering if his efforts to go unnoticed were paying off. He noticed that the king didn't seem to be paying him much attention, but the real concern was Wu Ahan, who appeared suspicious to him. He couldn't help but wonder why she kept observing him and silently hoped she would focus on her studies. After school, Hajin cautiously peered out of his classroom and concluded that there was nothing else to do for the day. He knew Ahan had been keeping an eye on him, but nothing had happened so far. He contemplated that maybe things would somehow work out if he stuck around. However, he realized that he should start thinking about finding a new part-time job. Two months of unemployment had left him completely broke, and he couldn't afford to stay jobless any longer. Hajin gazed at himself in the mirror, fully aware that his success was crucial to his safety. He muttered to himself that, with his present appearance, he should be able to land a service job without any trouble. He even had the audacity to imagine confidently informing his future boss about the arrival of a dashing part-timer ready to serve hot pot. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Shisuyu Chiha, 1201, who commented, Bruce, that says Gonzalez on our SSS Rank Hunter video. Thanks for commenting. However, his daydream was interrupted when Ahan suddenly appeared beside him. She urged him to remove the bandage from his face, causing him to jump back in surprise. She didn't pry for details, but advised him to be extra cautious, emphasizing that he was in greater danger than he realized. Hajin stared at her in shock as she calmly met his gaze. Just as their conversation ended, Ahan's friend called her and urged her to leave quickly. She agreed and informed Hajin that she was heading out. As she walked away, Hajin was left trembling with fear, his mind racing to understand the hidden danger she had alluded to. Soon, a burly, tattooed man approached him, demanding to know why their acquaintance had beaten up his friends and wanted to go home. He asked if Hajin had encountered such an individual. Hajin wondered if these were the individuals Ahan had warned him about. The man presented him with a choice, cooperate quietly or face immediate consequences. Hajin desperately wished they would just leave him alone and agreed to go with them. However, he inquired about the duration of this ordeal, mentioning his impending job interview. The man curtly informed him that he wouldn't be going home that day. Hajin noticed that all the bullies from their school had gathered and he couldn't help but remark on the embarrassing spectacle of them pursuing him all at once. This led to a heated exchange, with one man suggesting Hygiene had an inflated ego, 
because he had bested two of their friends. Another man cautioned Hygiene not to underestimate them, claiming they were different from those he had beaten before. In response, Hygiene punched one of the men in the face, sending him crashing to the ground unconscious while he challenged the group's assertion of their superiority. Unbeknownst to Hygiene, someone in the corner was observing the situation, and minutes later, all the men were incapacitated on the ground. Hajin realized that less than an hour had passed. He surmised that his focus on not releasing his inner energy had made it challenging to control his movements. As he touched his stomach, he resolved to be more cautious, catch his breath, and make it to his job interview. However, he failed to notice someone approaching behind him. Suddenly, he heard a footstep, and when he turned, a fist was hurtling toward him. He was struck in the face, causing his blue smoke to emerge from his ear, which filled him with panic as his energy leaked out. A man pinned him to the ground, and Hajin recognized him as Tai Song. Tai Song was equally taken aback by the energy emanating from Hajin's ears. Tai Song released his red smoke aura and called Hajin a loser, demanding to know where he had learned martial arts. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps. Meanwhile, the rooftop of the apartment building lay in ruins, with the men sprawled everywhere, exhausted and defeated. jung -gun attributed his fatigue to his advancing age and inquired whether they should conclude their confrontation. He referred to the individuals as Nam Gung's little ones, suggesting that they were under Nam Gung's influence. Approaching the team leader and the lady, the lady questioned Jiang Gun's motives and why he had suddenly revealed himself. Jiang Gun, instead of answering her directly, posed a question of his own, inquiring why they had hesitated in their swordplay. He suggested that if they had truly intended to kill him, he wouldn't have emerged unscathed, rendering their skills meaningless. Jung Gun asked if they had held back because he had asked them to do so. He turned his gaze toward the team leader and advised him that in the world of martial arts, one needed to act like a martial artist. Hesitation, he pointed out, would only hinder their progress. This left the man clenching his teeth in frustration. The lady, her anger rising, demanded to know what Yang Gun knew and what qualifications he had to make such statements. She even threatened to kill him right there. Jong Gun acknowledged that he had overstepped his bounds and announced his departure, suggesting that if fate willed it, they might meet again. With that, he vanished into thin air, leaving the lady sitting on the ground, weary and bewildered as she wondered where Yang Gun had suddenly disappeared to and checked on her senior's condition. The man, meanwhile, remained silent, tightly gripping his sword. Jung Gun swiftly leapt off the rooftop, convinced that now that the big fish had made an appearance, the small fish would go unnoticed. He couldn't help but think of Hygiene and hoped that Hygiene wouldn't attract any unwanted attention. In the dark tunnel, Hygiene confronted Tai Song, demanding to know what martial arts and secrets he was referring to. Tai Song aimed a fist at him, warning him that he wouldn't find out anything if he didn't evade. Hygiene leaped away, landing a few paces apart, clutching his head in pain and frustration. <sighs> tai Song, still on guard, pointed out that Hygiene clearly knew how to use Ki and accused him of pretending to be ignorant. He went on to reveal that his father was involved in the King Company's business and that he was the company's successor, often referred to as the prince in the industry. Tai Song was surprised that Hygiene had managed to learn so much in such a short time. He then questioned Hygiene about the remnants of sect members hiding somewhere and the source of his knowledge. Tai Song's demeanor turned menacing as he threatened Hygiene to reveal the truth while implying that his life might be spared if he complied. However, Hygiene countered by asking what would happen if he refused to cooperate. Tai Song responded with a sinister <laughs> smile, advancing toward Hygiene, laughing and clenching his fist, implying that he would be subjected to a severe beating and humiliation. In a desperate attempt to shield his face, Hygiene raised his hands, but he quickly realized that his guard was insufficient. He leaped to the side to evade Tai Song's attack. Realizing that his key couldn't fully protect him, Tai Song launched another assault, taunting Hygiene for recklessly spreading his key without skill. He struck Hygiene's hands, which were still guarding his face, and berated him as trash. Tai Song provocatively asked if Hygiene had derived enjoyment from beating up others with martial arts as if he believed he could take over the school. He cruelly stated that Hygiene remained as pathetic as ever and vowed to kill him and the person who had taught him martial arts for not knowing his place and fooling around. To Hygiene's surprise, Tai Song suddenly turned around and delivered a powerful kick to his chest, shouting that this was not how things were supposed to be. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What is the best martial arts weapon? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. Despite being thrown away, Hajin struggled to stand up, while Tai Song questioned why he bothered learning martial arts when he could have kept a low profile. Tai Song playfully suggested that Hajin would have been a bit smarter and that he would have saved face in front of Ahan, emphasizing the value of friendship in such situations. Confused, Hygiene asked Tai Song about Ahan and the idea of beauty. Tai Song furthered the intrigue, 
questioning whether Hygien believed that the bullies followed him blindly just because they listened to someone. He insinuated that if Hygien wanted to place blame, a Han should be the target because people sometimes go to great lengths to impress girls. Shocked by this revelation, Hajin was about to question Tai Song further when Tai Song <laughs> humorously finished his sentence by saying that he had been playing with Hajin's emotions. Tai Song bent down, signaling the end of their playful banter, and released his red smoke aura, which burned everything it touched. Hajin stood up and confirmed that he had made a decision. He acknowledged that he had been flustered initially, but had now resolved to proceed. He clenched his fist, releasing his blue aura and told Tai Song that he needed to continue learning and would figure the rest out later. Tai Song, angered by Hai Jin's response, insulted him and questioned his worth as a prince. He then began relentlessly punching Hai Jin, who shielded his face with his hands. Tai Song taunted Hai Jin, suggesting that blindly copying others wouldn't get him far. As Tai Song continued his assault, Hai Jin pushed back with his aura, causing Tai Song to pause and question whether he had been pushed aside. Hai Jin thanked Tai Song for teaching him something valuable that strength could be increased by kneading the dough of his aura. He released his aura and challenged Tai Song, stating that it wasn't as difficult as Tai Sang believed. Tai Song, furious at Hai Jin's glare, unleashed more aura and shouted at him not to give him that look. They both assumed positions for a showdown, with Hai Jin inviting Tai Song to come at him. Tai Sang charged toward Hai Jin, creating cracks in the ground, while Hai Jin braced himself. Their fists collided, and Hai Jin was momentarily pushed back. However, he stood his ground and taunted Tai Song, asserting that compared to his master, Tai Song was nothing. Suddenly, a smiling man feigned surprise and struck Hai Jin in the nape, catching him off guard. Hai Jin shouted in surprise, and his vision began to blur. The man apologized to him, explaining that he had to stop the fight at that point. Hai Jin collapsed on the ground while Tai Song asked the man what the hell he was doing there. The man sweetly called Tai Song young master, told him it's been a long time, and asked if he thinks his father might call for an emergency meeting because the general has appeared. The man told Tai Song that he was just out for a walk, sensed some energy, so he came to check it out. It turns out it was the young master's friend. The man told him that he owes him one, making him surprised, and asked what he is talking about. However, the man just asked him back what he meant when he saved him, and told him that if he had left it alone for a few more seconds, he would be done. Tai Song told the man not to be ridiculous, and even if he left it alone, he would have won on his own. Then Tai Song told the man that he was annoying, butting in and talking nonsense. He angrily glared at the man who was glaring back in silence. However, the man smilingly apologized to him and told him to forgive him with his generous heart, making Tai Song angrier. Then the man grabbed Hai Jin, telling Tai Sang that he'll take that friend of his, and that their meeting turned out to be more fun than he thought. The man walked out of the tunnel holding Hajin on his shoulder without noticing someone hiding behind the tree. Ahan peeked out and was frustrated to see Hajin being dragged out. Later, at the King Company headquarters in the city, the team leader and the lady were walking in the corridor. The lady told the man that she really didn't want to go in and asked if she could just say she was sick and leave early. The man replied that it was pointless to escape, and he understands she doesn't like it, but she should just bear with it for a little while. They arrived at the room door. They are Nam Gong Jin Jung, the sixth chief of the seven departments. And Nam Gong Jin Ah, the seventh chief, the person told them to come in, and the president was waiting for them. Inside the room, they saw five more people, the top executives of King Company's seven departments. The lady told them that she heard they were all robbed by the general, and the second chief of the seven departments, Big, called them a bunch of trash. The third chief of the seven departments, Glasses, looked at them teasingly. The fourth chief of the seven departments, Tank, laughed at them, and the fifth chief of the seven departments, Rapid, teasingly laughed at them too. Jin asked them what would have been different if they had fought, and Big replied that she would have been better than the two trashes. Big asked Jin what her problem was and if she wanted to fight. Jin Ah furiously grabbed her sword, but Jin Jung told her to wait and calm down. Suddenly, a man shouted that it was enough, and the King Company President, King, told them to calm down and that he didn't call them there to see them fight each other. Jin walked away in silence and Big sat back down. King told Jina and Jin Jung that General Park Jong-un was strong, and they were not to be blamed for losing to him, so they shouldn't blame themselves. Jin Jung thanked King. Rapid asked them why the old man suddenly appeared after hiding all this time, but Tank just asked Rapid back if he wasn't itchy, and one of the five asked them what they knew. King asked them if there was anything noteworthy, and Jin Jung replied that, in his personal opinion, he got the feeling that Zhang Gun was deliberately attracting attention. Big asked him for his basis, and he replied that Zhang Gun had a lot of spare time on his hands, and it was frustrating, but if Zhang Gun had wanted to, 
Everyone there would have been dead. Jong-un hadn't done it, and only a few people were injured, so he felt like Jong-un wanted to attract their attention. King told him that his opinion does have some merit. Big told him that, even if he tried to dress it up nicely, in the end, he owed his life to the enemy, and he always talked about being from a martial arts family. She asked him if he wasn't ashamed of himself for not being embarrassed making Jin furious and shouting that it was another insult. Jin Jung stopped his sister, replying that it was true, and they had nothing to say. Big shouted that it was boring. Glasses told them that if Jin Jung's hypothesis is correct, even though it is risky to appear in person, it appears that something Jung Goon didn't want to be revealed has occurred. In that case, the first thing that comes to his mind is that suddenly a man appeared in the meeting, holding Hai Jin, and continued by saying he guessed it was Jung Goon's disciple. The Iron Department's first chief, Cruel, apologized to the president for being a little late. Jin Young was surprised to see Cruel holding a man, and Big asked Cruel what he was doing there when he said it was boring. Cruel asked her back what she thought of him, and told her that sometimes he has to miss out due to unavoidable circumstances, but he does his best when he is there. While throwing Ha Jin on the floor, Cruel told King that Ha Jin seemed to be his son's friend, and they were fighting. Also, Ha Jin was quite good, so he decided to intervene. Even if he hadn't, his son would have definitely won, making King look at Ha Jin in silence. Then Cruel told King that at the same time, the general who had been in hiding for several years suddenly reappeared, and a friend who could do that also suddenly appeared. It doesn't seem like a coincidence, but it was not certain, and they'll find out if they play with that friend for a while, looking at Hyjin, who was passed out on the floor. Meanwhile, in some apartments, a uniform was on the floor, and when looked at closely, the uniform owner was Wu Ahan. She tied her hair up, put her belt on, placed her sword behind her back, and walked away, a completely different person. She speedily jumped out of her apartment building by building, then slid down knowing that she should hurry up. She safely landed on the ground and ran straight to the apartment door, thinking that it must be the house where she found Kengon, and there must be a clue to his origins. She grabbed the doorknob, knowing that somehow she needed to contact Han's master. Suddenly, Ahan hit the door hard near her, making her surprised. When she looked back, she saw someone telling her that she can't just go into someone else's house. She looked at him, agreeing, and realizing that he was General jong -un. He told her that he remembered her familiar outfit. Then he told her to think carefully before answering, and asked her who she is, but she just told him back if it was General Park and told him to put down his cane because she was in a hurry right now. However, he just told her to answer his question and asked her again who she was and what she was doing there. She replied that she understood, and he said he recognized that outfit. Then she grabbed his sword behind her, introduced herself as Ahan, and told him that they were on the same side because she is the daughter of the Majesty. He pulled his cane back, telling her that she was really the Majesty's daughter she told him that he wouldn't forget him. He told her how could he forget the leader of the Pure Stream sect. He was one of the strongest martial artists he had ever seen, even among those who fought against the Emperor. Majesty was strong, wise, and cheerful, a man who made him feel good when he was around him. But in the end, he fell into their trap and died. He told her that he did hear that he had a daughter, and that if Majesty had survived, he would be about General's age. He also told her that she said her name was Wu Ahan, and that he has many questions. But for now, he'll just ask one. Then he seriously asked her what happened to Ha Jin. She put his sword on her back while realizing that Jang Gun is really the one who taught and told Jang Gun that she doesn't usually like to talk about coincidences. But his disciple is currently in serious danger. Meanwhile, in some rooms, blood splattered everywhere, and Hei Jin was being beaten up continuously while being chained. He kneeled on the ground, choking on his own blood. But Cruel told him that it was enough warm-up for now and that he was just asking. Cruel wondered if he was going to talk. Then Cruel showed jong Goon a picture while asking him if that homeless old man was his master and where he is now. However, he just looked at the picture and used his aura to free himself from the chains. He was surprised when the chains reacted and became tighter, and Wan told him that it was useless because it's a special technique. If he answers honestly, he'll let him go. And if he wants, he'll take him to the boss and even get him a job while grabbing his hair. But he just spit on Cruel, who blocked it using John Gun's picture. Then Cruel looked at him creepily and threw the picture while saying that a man should have that much guts. Then Cruel thanked him for not revealing his cover so quickly and headed toward the tools on the table. He thought it was his fault because, even though his master warned him, he took it lightly and followed his emotions, and that is what happened so at least he has to take responsibility for it himself. Then he told Cruel to do whatever he wants, but it won't work, and he doesn't know anything. Cruel grabbed the scalpel, telling him that everyone says it at first. Then he showed the sharp scalpel to him and told him that they should start with his fingernails. In the other room, King is sitting with Glasses. King asks Glasses how it's going, and Glasses replies that the reconnaissance team has initiated the operation. If they wait a little longer, they'll gather some information. King says they must locate Jong-Goon by any means necessary, 
because if they can catch him and get what he has, even the Emperor can be surpassed, and their company will be at the top of the martial arts world. King also tells Glasses that the fact must not reach the ears of the other organizations, and asks about the cover-up. Glasses reply that there is no problem, at least for the time being. On the other hand, outside the King Company building, the guards were looking around. Then a lady in heels and a man in the proper shoes both walked closer to the company. The guards told them to wait and asked who they were, and if they knew where they were because they can't just barge in. However, the lady released her yellow aura, telling the guards to move, and the guards were down on the ground by a strong force. One of the guards looked up to see who it was and replied, Okay, letting the lady and the man walk inside. A moment later, in front of the King Company chairman's office, the guards were surprised to hear someone in their earpiece device. The man asked what he said while the other man was trying to get the person on the other line. One of the guards told the other person to wait a minute, and he'll call back. When the man looked in front of him, he was surprised to see the lady saying that they are pretty good, and she doesn't think words will be enough. Then the man said that it was how it was. One of the guards reported that it was an emergency, and he had to tell the CEO right now. The man released his yellow aura and walked closer to the guards who were ready to stop him. However, the man just put his hands on the guards and released a little bit of his power, making the guards thrown inside the room and breaking the door in the process. Glasses looks back in surprise, and King looks at them in shock too. The lady tells King that it's been a while, and the woman, known as God, tells him that she heard that the general appeared there recently. Then the man tells him that according to the agreement, he would like him to share all the information he has. The Special Martial Artist Management Bureau Director known as Emperor. Meanwhile, in Hyajin's room, Ahan was standing near the window, silently waiting. Then Jung-gun, coughing, told her that he had made her wait. She asked him what took him so long. But she stopped talking when she saw Jung Gun in uniform. He told her that he knew the situation was urgent, but they needed to be prepared, especially since they were going to fight the king. They needed to do everything they could. He also mentioned that he couldn't believe Hajin was in the same class as King's son, and all of it couldn't just be a coincidence. So he was sure she was not there by chance. She agreed with him and told him that, as he said, she intentionally chose to be in the same class as Tai Song. She had been collecting information while concealing her identity and waiting for an opportunity to avenge her father. Then she asked him if this was the opportunity she had been waiting for, and if he could defeat King. The old man replied that he was old, the King had gotten stronger, and going to his headquarters made it even more difficult. However, she shouldn't worry because he wouldn't lose to the King, and he would never lose. Meanwhile, in the company, the God and the Emperor were around King. God told them that it had been a while since the three of them had been together, and asked if it had been ten years, because even though so much time had passed, they were all the same, but Chi King furiously told her that it had been, except for her, a witch-like woman. She laughingly thanked King for the compliment, and Emperor told them to drop the chit-chat. Then he asked King to give him all the information he had on the general. Glasses asked them what they were talking about after suddenly barging in and what they meant by the general. God called Glasses a kid and told him that adults were talking, so it was better if he stayed quiet, using her aura to make Glasses bend down because of the force. Emperor told King that if he was trying to play dumb, it was useless because he already had a pretty good guess, making King ask Emperor what he was talking about. Emperor replied that the fact the General raided one of his offices, and the fact that he has a high school student who is suspected to be the General's disciple, made King shocked. Emperor guessed that he underestimated the Special Martial Artists Management Bureau's intelligence. Then God teasingly told Emperor that it was creepy like a stalker. Emperor told them that after the war ended 18 years ago, their two organizations made an agreement with the Special Martial Artists Management Bureau to share information about surviving illegal martial artists with each other and cooperate when they secure them. Also among them is the General. Emperor tells King that Park jong -un is a class, a dangerous person, and that he is obligated to report any information he finds to the Special Martial Artists Management Bureau immediately, but he didn't do it, so it is his last chance, and he better share the information. If he doesn't, he will be considered to have violated the agreement. They will take appropriate action. Then Emperor released his powerful aura and told King that he would disband the King Company. He asked him what he is going to do, making King surprised. Meanwhile, outside, jung and Ahan landed on the building roof near the King Company building. Ahan told jung that if her guess was correct, Hygiene was in the basement of the building in the torture room. He told her that even after a few years, the dirty stench is still the same, and that he'll get Hygiene out first. He was about to explain to Ahan how to go to the basement, but suddenly a powerful yellow aura came out of the building, making him surprised. He knew that the aura was from the Emperor because no one else could have such a fierce aura, the Emperor sure senses it quickly and comes looking. She tells him to wait a minute, and if the Emperor is there, he continued by saying that she is probably there too, since the three organizations have made such an agreement, 
making her shocked. Then she tells him that she hated to say it after calling him, but if that was the case, she thought it was best to retreat for now. She didn't think even the general could take on those three at once, and if they rushed in now, there is a high chance that they'll get caught. Instead of saving Kong Hyajin, they probably won't kill Hyajin, because Hyajin is an important informant, so for now they should retreat and plan for later. He tightly grabs his cane and tells her that she is right. Meanwhile, in the King Company basement, at the entrance to the torture room, God tells King that it is barbaric, and he replies that it is a surefire way. She has no right to interfere with their methods. Then they arrived at the door and knocked on it. Cruel opened the door while asking what it was, and that he was busy right now. But then he noticed that the guests had arrived. Emperor asks if that man is cruel. God asks if it was the pretty good kid too. About right. And man level king asked. W if he had gotten anything. Cruel replied that he was afraid not yet. Then Cruel explained to them that Hygiene was quite a tough kid, which is rare to see these days. If they waited a day or two more, he could make something, but Songai replied no and that she didn't like it because she was busy. Then she asked them if it was okay that she was going to make Hygien talk right now. Emperor replied fine, making Cruel angry. She looks at Hygien and says that Cruel really did get it in a barbaric way. He asked her what it was again and told her that he didn't know who she was, but she should go away. But she just tells him that he looked about the same age as her daughter, but he had been through a lot. Then she holds his face while telling him to just wait a little longer because she'll make him feel comfortable now. Then she used her aura and asked him if he could tell her where the general was making him stunned in shock while the men were looking at them in the back. He knows that he shouldn't say it, but his mouth is acting up, and when he's about to tell where the general was, suddenly Jongun appeared behind them and said that the general was there, making them shocked. He glared at them, and King and God were surprised to see him, but Emperor just tells him that it was unexpected, and he didn't think he'd attack, then asks him if he thinks the king is alone. He replied that it was not. If they were martial artists, there would be times when they just couldn't back down, softly looking at the beaten Hajin. Then he slams his foot on the ground and swings his cane forward while releasing his powerful aura, furiously tells them that he dared to touch his disciple and asks them if they are prepared. Meanwhile, outside the building, Ahan was still on the other building's rooftop, continuously cursing to herself, remembering Jongen agreeing with her. When she was about to tell him that they should go, Jongen attacked her on the shoulders and on her side, making her kneel on the floor. Jongen told her that she should stay there and not worry because he'd come back and release her. She noticed that she couldn't move her body and asked him why. He replied that he was tired of seeing young people die instead of old people, and if they are martial artists, there are times when they can't back down. On the other hand, inside the room, Jongun was looking at them while releasing his power. He worriedly called his master, but Jongun told him that he had been through a lot and he'd save him soon. She always used his jade palm and added the divine art to attack Jonggun, but Jonggun used his iron hammer technique, demonic crush, to block King's attack. Then he turned around, making King shocked and kicked King away. King managed to stop himself from being thrown, and he asked Ha Jin before he freed him what should he do with these guys, making King call him an old man in anger and shouting to order his people to get out of there and ensure the employee's safety. But Cruel told King that it was a golden opportunity, and he wanted to fight the general too. Glasses also agreed and told Chimu that they would also provide support, but King furiously shouted that he'll take that old man down himself, and he won't forgive anyone who gets in his way, making Glasses feel the force of his stare. But Cruel just said that King has gotten serious. Then Cruel grabbed Glasses, telling him that they should go, because when King is like this, not even God can stop him. God told Emperor that King has always been obsessed with weird things, but Emperor just kept quiet. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at Ryan Balana, underscore 07 who commented part 5 on our Betrayed Isekai video. Thanks for commenting. Jangun peeked at the man who got out, telling King that his pride was still there. But King, who was using his Jade Palm third level, replied no. Then he jumped forward to him and told him that it was confidence. He launched his fist while using his Tiger's Roar Claw technique swinging his cane around to shield himself. Noticing that King was stronger than he thought, King asked him if it is all he has got, and told him that he has been training tirelessly for that very moment, and he'll seek revenge for his defeat from 18 years ago. He simply told King that he is certainly amazing, but then he swung his cane forward, making King surprised. Then he attacked King using his iron hammer technique, Six Swarm Heaven, telling him that he is not the only one who has been training. King covered his face with his arms while Jung Gun was hitting him, then he speedily appeared in front of King and told him that he is tough when he thought he is a pushover. Then he told him to keep taking it, and he swung his cane forward to attack King, who was covering his face and waiting for the attack to hit him. But then Jonggun speedily ran behind him, making him shocked. Then Jonggun broke the chains and held Hyajin, asking him if he was okay and if he could hold on. He asked his master why he was helping him when he got caught because of his mistake. 
but Jonggun told him that it was only natural for a master to protect his disciple. King furiously called Jonggun, making Jonggun tell him that they should discuss it later, but for now, they should get out of there. While getting something from his jacket, he threw a bomb at King, who angrily asked him if he thinks he'll just let him leave so easily. Then he used his aura to take off the bomb trigger, and it exploded in King's face. King angrily asked him what nonsense it is, but he just jumped away while holding Hei Jin, and told King that he is glad he is still simple-minded. He ran speedily toward the door, telling Hygiene to just hold on a little longer, because if they kept going at full speed, they could come out. But then Sangai sweetly called him, making him surprised. He blocked in time as God attacked while telling him that he has used all of his modern weapons. She also told him that she'd love to play a one-on-one -on -one duel, but if he attempted to escape, it was a different matter, to which Emperor agreed. Emperor told Chimu that he attempted to honor his desires, but a fair fight is distinct from preventing an escape, and he can't allow Jonggun to leave at that point, making King pissed. King, God, and Emperor looked at him, the general, making him realize that as he expected, things don't go smoothly. Then Jonggun asked Hygien if he can run, and he replied yes somehow, to which Jonggun said it was a relief. Then Jonggun lifted him up and forcefully threw him out of the room, making him shocked. Jonggun told him to hurry up and get away while he'll keep them occupied there. He tried to tell his master to wait, but Jonggun just closed the room door, smiling at him. Then Jonggun faced them, saying that he has managed to fulfill his goal somehow, and asked them if adults should be left to the adults. Then he swung his cane, telling them that if they seek his head, they should take it whenever they please. On the other hand, Heijin knocked on the torture room door while calling his master continuously. He was frustrated that, because of him, his master was sacrificing, and he thought that if he had only behaved properly, that wouldn't have happened. Suddenly, someone asked him how he managed to escape, and told him that the old man is really amazing. Then Cruel told him that he came by just in case, but he was glad he did. Cruel also told him that he was told not to touch the general, but he wouldn't mind if he played with him a little. Then Cruel put his sword back in its sheath, and told him that he'll let him do his best and he could use one of those swords, making him angrily call Cruel a bastard and stand up, telling Cruel that he'll kill him. On the other hand, inside the room, Emperor told Jonggun that he is planning to buy time for his disciple to escape, and asked him if he really thinks it is possible against the three of them. He swung his cane backward and told them that they won't know until he tries. Then he jumped toward them speedily, and activated his iron hammer technique, the sixth level, to attack King making King surprised, but King managed to block it using his tiger hammer strike in time, but he noticed that Jonggun had gotten stronger than before. He forcefully pressed his cane on King, making King forcefully thrown hard on the ground, and Sangai surprised, but Emperor just silently looked at King. Emperor told them that it was congenital true energy, and Jonggun raised his kai in exchange for his life. Jonggun told them that he had to do at least that much against the three of them, but Emperor told him that he can't understand it, and asked him if that kid is worth going to such length for. He replied that he'd never understand, because he was a person who only saw people as tools. Then he slammed his cane on the ground, telling them that the place was a bit cramped for four people to fight, and the ground shook hard. Then he swung his cane around him, telling them that they should change the location. The King Company building slowly collapsed, floor by floor, and the building was destroyed. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps. A voice suddenly echoed from behind the old man, heaping praise upon Jonggun for harnessing life energy to surpass all expectations. Behind the resolute general, the figures of the king, god, and emperor emerged, all bearing wounds and clad in tattered attire. The emperor asserted that even two of them would prove too formidable a challenge for Jonggun. With a hand stained in blood, the king cursed the old man for the suffering inflicted upon him and his loyal retinue. God, her eyes filled with bitterness and exhaustion, lamented the ruin of her favorite dress at the hands of the old man. Jonggun, still struggling to rise, clung to a staff for support but found his strength waning with every futile attempt. Observing his exhausted and weakened adversary, the emperor concluded that the old man's power was waning. Stepping closer to the general, the emperor extended a hand charged with key energy, signaling the end of their confrontation. Meanwhile, in the basement of the same building, Another battle was nearing its conclusion. Heijin unleashed a powerful punch, sending Cruel hurtling down the hallway. Cruel's eyes flickered, and moments later, the first chief's lifeless body crumpled to the ground. Heijin, drained of strength, collapsed beside him, relieved that he had finally emerged victorious. To his surprise, the torturer, far from dead, was still conscious, clutching his injured face. Cruel, wearing a sinister grin, questioned whether the boy had been biding his time for this moment then retaliated with a powerful strike. As the schoolboy struggled to stand, Cruel continued to taunt, remarking that a slightly stronger blow would have killed him. Though trembling from exhaustion, the boy defiantly raised his arms in a fighting stance, 
signaling his unyielding determination. However, Cruel questioned the need to continue the fight, leaving the schoolboy in bewilderment. Cruel reminded the boy of the promise he made to spare him if he landed a single hit. Rising from the ground, the first chief inquired if the boy truly desired to fight to the bitter end. With a smile, <laughs> Cruel assured him that death would come swiftly, but he would honor his word. He added that Hygien had grown on him. Gathering their discarded swords from the floor, Cruel instructed the boy to escape and promised a thrilling rematch in the future. He pointed towards a corridor, indicating the exit where the boy could leave the building. As he spoke, cracks spiderwebbed across the wall behind him. Seconds later, a cascade of concrete fragments rained down upon them. When he looked at the hole formed in the place of the door, Cruel got upset and said that it had happened at the wrong time. A picture of the battle between the general and the rest of the masters came into view. The old man's back was all torn up, with blood flowing profusely in many places. Hajin <laughs> stared at the teacher in horror, amazed at the state this once strong and healthy man was in. With a shout, the boy rushed toward Jangun, who noticed the boy out of the corner of his eye. But Cruel immediately grabbed the schoolboy's neck telling him to calm down because his teacher was dead anyway. If the boy ran over there, he would risk getting killed himself. Cruel offered to stay in a safe place and observe what was going on. The Emperor appeared on the debris. Turning to the General, he said that he had surprised him greatly. You have exceeded all my expectations. Even after absorbing so much life energy, you still have the strength to fight back, the Emperor said admiringly. The King, who was standing behind him, shouted that now the old man was definitely finished. God, revealing the fan, noted that she had now become too weak to fight back. Let's finish him off with this blow. Raising his hand, the Emperor said solemnly, holding his hand to his punctured stomach. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. What is a good martial arts technique? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. The general groaned, trying to gather strength for a last defense, raising his staff with one hand, the other covering his wound. Jong Gun hoped that at least one of his enemies would take at least one of them with him to the other world. Their forces were originally not equal, but now the superiority was painfully colossal. All three of them broke from their seats at once and attacked the general. In response to the faction leader's blows, Jong-un tried one last time to put up a block with his staff. The final moments of this legendary battle were coming to an end, but suddenly the Emperor abruptly changed the direction of the attack. He dashed past the injured old man without hitting him. Given the chance, Jong-un instantly assessed the situation and realized where Emperor was headed. The Emperor was rapidly approaching Krul, who was holding Hajin by the neck, applying the Dragon Strike. He was ready to kill the boy with one blow, but in the next instant, at the place where Hajin and the Emperor were, a huge jade pillar of energy burst into the sky. The schoolboy's face was splattered with scarlet blood. He was staring horrified, staring straight ahead. Opposite him stood the general. From behind, the Emperor's hand slammed into his back. The blow was so strong that it pierced his spine. The master's body weakened. Hygiene still couldn't believe what had happened. The Emperor, without changing his expression, muttered that he had originally counted on the old man running here to save the boy. As it turned out, he was right. The general lowered his eyes and spat the blood that came to his mouth. His mouth was practically unable to move. Was this really the end? His eyes were slowly beginning to darken. It looked like he hadn't had the best life. Suddenly, Ha Jin called out to the old man. jang slowly looked up. He looked into his student's fear-filled eyes. He had already seen such horrors at such a young age. Still, there was something he wanted to do towards the end. Reaching out two fingers, he touched the boy's chest. Some jade energy flowed into his body. Ha Jin! Live, the mentor spoke softly. Tears came to the boy's eyes. What was he to do next? Where to go? Who would he turn to? At that second, the Emperor threw the General's body behind his back, throwing him with all his might into the wall. Emperor continued to stand nonchalantly with his bloody right hand. The General's assassination is complete, he solemnly stated. The boy looked at the teacher's body in horror. He was overwhelmed with emotion. A nervous breakdown was approaching. Unable to stand it, Hyajin screamed trying to get out of Krul's arms. As he passed by the boy, the Emperor said that the student should be killed as well. At that second, he squeezed the student's organs with his energy. The impact was so strong that blood came out of the guy's mouth. At the same second, a moment later, Hajin's body fell breathlessly to the ground. As he left, the Emperor added that today's catch had been quite good. Pausing for a moment, he ordered everyone to clean the place up. After that, Emperor leisurely headed towards the exit of the room. Standing in the center of the resulting ruins, the king looked around at the destruction and had no idea how much money it would take to rebuild the building. Standing up from the concrete block and curling up her fan, God swept it up. It wasn't as interesting towards the end anymore. Saying that, she left. Meanwhile, Cruel looked sadly at Hojin's corpse. Kicking the boy's body, he thought that this schoolboy was quite capable. Too bad he chose the losing side. Well, it can't be helped, the first chief said with a change of mood. After calling the royal company's services on the phone, 
He summoned people to dispose of the corpses. That night, outside of town, in the woods on one of the hills, work was in full swing. A sanitation team of several men was digging one large grave, somewhere in a thicket of trees. Looking at the body bag, one of the diggers asked his partner if the famous general had died so trivially. He went from boss to emperor, and what in the end? As they talked over each other, one of the orderlies asked who the type in the second bag was. The familiar explained to him that this boy was a pupil of the general, who had come running to rescue the schoolboy and died. Grinning, one of the gravediggers said that that kid was too young and just picked the wrong teacher. Meanwhile, Heijin's stomach began to glow as he lay in the bag. An aura of jade energy appeared where Jang-Goon had touched him before he died. Suddenly, the energy cloud made a key surge outwards, and in the area around the location of the heart, jade energy streams appeared one after another. After a moment, the kid suddenly let out a sound. The diggers noticed a sudden movement in the body bag, much to their surprise. Approaching the body with a shovel at the ready, one of the gravediggers irritably said that the Emperor, as usual, couldn't finish anything properly. All he knows how to do is cause trouble. The orderly shouted in rage, bringing his shovel to finish off the waking boy. But then a blade suddenly flew out of the forest thicket towards the gravediggers. As it flew close to the digger, the dagger split the shovel in two, startling the attendant. The knife stabbed into a tree nearby and drew the attention of the entire group. An unknown girl suddenly came out from behind a tree, holding a blade in her hand. She asked the ringleader who she was, and asked if the young man in the sack was still alive. Grabbing a black sword from behind her back, the girl mouthed that she wouldn't let that boy die at the hands of those diggers. With a glance at Heejin, she said she would take him with her, glaring angrily at her opponents. The stranger decided there was no turning back for her. The workers grabbed their shovels from the ground at the sight of the approaching sword-wielding girl. One of them shouted in panic that someone had ratted them out. The squad leader ordered his subordinates to come to their senses. After all, it was just a woman in front of them. The next second, he ordered the big men with shovels to finish the stranger off and bury her with those corpses. Looking at the villains with hatred, the girl decided it was even better this way. That way, no one would remember her face. A few moments later, a hand ran alongside each of the orderlies at lightning speed, slashing them with her sword in the process. Stopping behind the backs of the big men, the girl thought it was easier than she had imagined. Just then, the bodies of the diggers fell one after another. The scene horrified the squad leader. Sheathing his blade, he pointed it at the stranger, panicking as he asked who she was. At the same time, Ahan walked up to her opponent and concentrated key energy in her left hand. With a run, the girl struck the gravedigger in the jaw with her fist. The group leader recoiled from his attacker, spitting blood through his teeth. In the next instant, Ahan had her sword in both hands, preparing to end the short bout. Lightning fast, using the four seconds pure stream technique, she activated the water stream ability and chopped the rogue. A moment later, the gravedigger collapsed on his back with no sign of life. Ahan ran toward where the body bags lay. Running to the spot, she began unzipping the bag, praying that Hei Jin was alive. In the bag, the girl saw a terrible picture. Her classmate was lying on his back. All his clothes were bloody, his face and hands were bruised, and in the center of his chest, an unknown aura of greenish color was swirling. Overwhelmed by what she saw, Ahan stated that he was very seriously injured but still alive. Taking a closer look at the jade energy, the girl assumed that the guy had stayed alive thanks to this aura. Piling on Ha Jin's uneasy body, she decided she would figure it all out later. But for now, it was time for them to get out of there. Looking at the general's body bag, Ahan thought she should get him out of here sometime too. But at that moment, a radio conversation was heard behind her. The surviving squad leader was relaying information to the main office, lying in a pool of his own blood. The group leader reported that they were under attack and needed reinforcements. They radioed that help was on the way. Ahan walked toward the gravedigger. At the last moment, he cheekily asked the stranger if she knew who she was messing with. A second later, the girl kicked the leader of the squad in the face, smashing his head. The creepy guy dropped dead without any signs of life, dropping the phone. Ahan crushed the device as well, angry that there was definitely no way to retrieve Junk Body now. The girl hurried to flee the scene as quickly as possible. Before leaving, she took one last look around and looked at the remaining bag, mentally saying goodbye and apologizing to the general. Ahan hurried to safety. Hijin was tormented by a very strange and frightening dream. He dreamed that some bastards were tormenting Park Jong-un with impunity, slashing his back into blood. He then had a vision of an emperor who personally wanted to kill him. Finally, the boy saw the breathless body of his teacher, whereupon he screamed at the top of his voice. In a cold sweat, the guy woke up, trying to step back from what he had seen, with his only healthy eye wide open. Heejin fell into a stupor. Shouldn't he be dead right now? Wondering where he was now, the boy saw a girl approaching. Noticing his awakening, the boy was very surprised to see a classmate in front of him. The girl said with a serious face that she was already waiting for him to wake up. 
pulling the blanket off of himself and trying to get up. Heejin patiently asked where the mentor was and what had happened to him. At that moment, the boy was taken by Ahan's hand. Seeing the growing panic in the young man's eyes, the girl said she realized he was confused, looking sternly at her classmate. Ahan told him to calm down, and then she would explain everything to him. In that instant, Hajin had already realized that everything he had just dreamed was not a terrifying dream, but a bitter memory. In the next few minutes, the girl told how all the events looked from her side. From her words, when the general touched the boy, everything was already over. With a dejected look, Ahan said she was able to follow them to retrieve the bodies, but she was only able to save Heejin. In the end, she couldn't do anything but watch again. Sadly, said the girl. She also added that when she first saved her classmate, there was still a trace of the general's energy burning in his chest. From her words, Jang-Goon used the last remnant of his life energy to save Heijin. After saying that, the guy sadly touched his chest, summarizing that he had given the rest of his life away. Smiling, the boy told Ahan that she knew he wouldn't hesitate long, and now he simply has no other choice. There's no other way to do it. At the end, Hajin added that he didn't care if his classmate agreed, because otherwise he would avenge Jagan alone, bleeding sweat. The girl said that the guy himself should have seen how strong the top three were. Did he really think he could even scratch any of them? Getting out of bed, Hajin confirmed that he was no match for them right now, but there's always an easier way, isn't there? The boy muttered with a smirk. Recovering, the boy came to the basement where his teacher had trained him. Sadly walking through the familiar corridors, Hajin looked up and saw a familiar thing on the rack general's green coat. Taking off his jacket and walking over to the wall, the boy thought that what he was looking for must be in here somewhere. Seeing a barely visible notch in the wall, the guy pressed it, and to his surprise, the button yielded and squeaked into the wall. Immediately, a passage to a lighted room opened before his eyes. It was a rather small room with drawers near the walls filled with various useful things. The whole place glistened, as if even the general had never been here before. Hajin's attention was immediately drawn to the order. Everything was arranged on separate shelves in separate drawers. Immediately, his gaze fell on a stand with various traditional oriental weapons, throwing knives, katanas, sabers. It seemed that one could choose a cold weapon for every taste. After standing at the entrance for a bit, the boy finally ventured into the room. Just then, he hung the general's coat on a nail nailed to the wall throwing off his hoodie. Hajin's mind flashed back to the events that had happened a few weeks ago. One day, the general approached the boy and told him to go take a shower and go to bed, but the student didn't respond. By that time, the boy, exhausted from training, was sleeping on the mattress like a dead man and did not react to the sounds around him. Looking at Hajin, Jong-un realized that he must have given his disciple an impossible task. But you couldn't let a guy go to bed dirty. Then the master thought of a way to fix it. Immediately, he turned around and walked to the other end of the hallway. The boy lay serenely on the floor and snored. At that moment, the space around him shook, and pieces of concrete rumbled from the ceiling. These sounds instantly woke Hyajin up, and he jumped to his feet, thinking it was an earthquake. He looked at the end of the hallway and saw the teacher, and asked him to stand by the supporting columns. But coming to his senses, Hyajin saw that the general was standing in slippers in front of the suddenly opened secret door. The angry apprentice ran up to the master and asked him what he was hiding from him again. Jung Gun replied frustratedly that a loose bolt had let him down. The hero stepped closer and wondered why all this time the general had kept this room hidden from him. Hearing no answer, the lad thought the teacher was going to sleep alone in the clean room, leaving the student in damp and filth. Grabbing Hajin's shoulder and squeezing his acupuncture nerve, Jung Gun replied that this was a special place you couldn't just walk in here. Collapsing to his knees in pain, the guy mouthed that it was like he almost died. The general added that he would consider letting the student into the room when he learned the basics of martial arts. Adjusting his towel, the old man muttered that the boy would surely get there if he worked diligently. Looking at Hajin, jang said that he didn't know when that day would come, but the guy would definitely become stronger. Pushing away the pleasant memories, the hero stopped releasing energy. Immediately, he thought about how he should prepare to destroy all of his enemies. The boy looked around the room once more. There were many martial arts books in gleaming cabinets, and weapons glittered on the walls. It looked as if no one had ever used them. Nevertheless, Hea Jin couldn't think of where he should start. Suddenly, the boy's gaze fell on the laptop on the table. As he got closer, the guy thought there was a chance that the device might have some useful information on it. Sitting comfortably at his chair, the hero turned on his laptop hopefully. Soon, the computer booted up, and what the boy discovered made him shudder. There was a text file on the desktop. Judging by the name, it was addressed to Hea Jin. With trepidation, he clicked on the file hoping that here he would find the answers to all his questions. At the beginning of the post, the general wrote that if the boy is reading this post, that means he is alive and Jong-Goon is dead. The teacher continued that this was hardly the outcome he wanted and expected, but he was glad all the same. 
case things turned out the way they did. The general wanted Ha Jin to live a quiet life. Jang Gun asked that the guy not think about revenge and just get on with his life like a normal person. Nevertheless, the master wrote that if a student read this, it was unlikely that anything would be able to stop him. The master wished he could immobilize him and set him on the right path. Realizing that his words were powerless, the general decided that he saw no other way but to help the boy. For this purpose, he decided to leave simple explanations in his message. According to Jang Gun, all the items in the room were the legacy of martial arts from 20 years ago. The general had collected them from the bodies of his fallen comrades. The old man further wrote that all these artifacts are one of the reasons why the king, god, and emperor were after him. Among all of them, it is the king who wants to seize these items the most to consolidate his power. Therefore, due to the circumstances, he Jin becomes the heir to all these artifacts. The phrase made the boy feel devastated. Gathering his thoughts, the boy continued reading. The general wrote that he had arranged all the artifacts in a special folder, and the student would be able to choose a more suitable item and study it. At the end, Jang Gun added that he believed Ha Jin would handle everything. The last words made the boy sad. The feeling of losing the person who seemed to be his family still did not leave him. Moving away from the table, the boy mentally thanked the teacher for the right thoughts. However, as he stood up from his chair, the hero thought that he had already chosen the artifact with which he would fight against his opponents. At that moment on the laptop, he had Jin was already looking at the information on the battle staff. Walking over to the stand, the boy reached out for the weapon. Taking the staff, the hero looked at it with interest. It was just like the one the general had used in battle. Confidently, he cranked the weapon in his hands, getting used to its weight and center of gravity. Looking at the perfectly polished surface of the staff, Hajin thought that now he would definitely become stronger and destroy those bastards. In the next second, he slammed the weapon into the ground with a clatter. After a while, swing after swing began to be heard in the separate training room Ha Jin practiced in, sweating and slicing the air with his staff. This was the beginning of a long and grueling journey to becoming a master. The first month was spent solely on physically perfecting the hero's body and improving body movements. By the second month, the boy added learning the theoretical basics of wielding a staff to the practice. By half a year old, Hei Jin had already trained using the artifact's abilities. Gradually, the hero gained more and more experience, and as a consequence, he gained more energy. At the end of the first year, the guy's body had transformed beyond recognition, and his Kai had become fantastically strong. It seemed that the boy's aura was vast enough for him to fight enemies on par. A woman's screams were heard over the evening city. One girl was calling a friend to karaoke to relieve stress. In response to her friend's pleas, Wuan once again replied that they were actually in high school and she wouldn't be able to make it today. Holding her phone in her hand, the girl replied that maybe she would join the hangout next time. One of the girlfriends wondered why all of a sudden Ahan couldn't. Another girl whispered that their classmate finally had a date tonight. Laughing, the schoolgirl with the short haircut was surprised at Ahan's choice. Her friend agreed and suggested not to pick on her classmate. Turning around and heading towards the club, the girl said goodbye to Ahan. After walking a few blocks, the schoolgirl grabbed her head and mouthed that she hoped the guy wouldn't be late today. After a few intersections, the girl turned down a thin, dark alley. Long time no see calm male voice was heard from behind. Ahan turned around and looked behind her. A tall, pumped-up guy came up behind her and asked how the girl had passed her exams, to which she replied that it shouldn't matter to him because he had dropped out of school. Lowering his staff, the boy wondered if he wasn't allowed to just inquire. Ahan replied that she didn't really want to go to university either. The schoolgirl glanced at her interlocutor and realized that she didn't really believe in the results of the training that Ha Jin was talking about. However, the result exceeded all her bold expectations. The girl was surprised that it was possible to change so much in a year. In response, the hero replied that, at a glance, it was not very noticeable. Without giving her face a sign of surprise, mentally Ahan marveled that such progress could be made in just a year. Even now, Hajin's aura was already unimaginably powerful. The boy was surprised to hear praise from his partner for the first time in their monthly meetings. Ahan replied evasively that the classmate had not been strong enough in the past. Frustrated, Hyojin asked what she meant, but without answering the question, the girl turned around and said that they could start now. With these words, she went deep into the alley and the boy followed her. Moving down the alley, Ahan said that she had made a plan and asked if her partner could stick to it. The hero replied that it was good that the girl had thought it over for him. Glaring at the boy, the schoolgirl reminded him not to relax. At the end, she added that he wasn't the only one who had been training for a year. In addition, the development of the plan also rested on her shoulders. A tall, red-haired guy in an expensive business suit was coming up the stairs of one of the houses. It was Tai Sang. As he looked around the room, he wondered why Ahan had suggested he meet on the roof. For a second, the prince thought that some kind of course was being held there. Whistling a song, Tai Sung walked up the stairs. 
thinking that surely a year of hard training must have helped the girl. And now she had just decided to call an old friend over for coffee and a chat. Swinging open the double doors, the prince shouted, calling out to Ahan. However, a male voice was heard in response, saying that he had already been waiting for Taesang. Across from him stood an unknown guy, and he added that he had been waiting for the meeting for a year. Looking at the man with the staff, the prince was horrified to see his classmate, Kong Haojin, standing in front of him. With a sharp wave of his staff, the hero spoke out that it was time to finish what had happened a year ago. Glaring angrily at his opponent, Heijin said that now the second round would finally happen. Taisang stared at his enemy in horror. His father, the chiefs of the seven departments, and the eyewitnesses all said that, in addition to the general, his student had been killed that day. Confused, the prince muttered that the guy across the street should have been dead for a year. Suddenly, a stomping sound came from behind him, causing Taisong to turn around. A woman's voice wondered if the company's heir wasn't sharing much information with him. To the prince's even greater surprise, Wu Ahan stood across from him with her sword behind her back. She looked at her classmate angrily and said mockingly, that her opponent didn't seem to hold a high position in the royal company. Exuding energy, Ahan said in response to Taisong's silence that she seemed to be right. Jumping down from the roof to Hyajin, the girl called the prince obtuse and muttered that he had made it easy for her with his stupidity. Still dumbfounded, Taisong watched in horror as the couple came to avenge him. Suddenly, the prince laughed, looking at Akin. He asked in surprise if she also practiced martial arts. He said that he realized why he had been attracted to her all this time still trying to cool things down. Taisang said that now he wouldn't have to try so hard, and they could make a great couple. Looking at his opponent frustratedly, Hajin remarked that their classmate was still as dumb as ever. Ahan agreed that this guy didn't change at all. Jumping to the edge of the roof, the girl said that she was now leaving Prince at her partner's disposal, as she had some business to attend to. At that moment, Taisang ran towards his partner, shouting after Ahan that she had promised him a date, Looking madly at his love, he shouted that he would make his girlfriend obedient. But immediately, Hajin blocked his opponent's path with a wave of his staff, telling him to take his time. Smiling, he said they should do a second round first. Realizing that the battle could not be avoided, Taisong became very nervous. Seeing this, Ahan said that now she was definitely running errands. The girl jumped on the roofs of the houses. Taisong kept urging her to stop. Glaring angrily at his enemy, the prince shouted that he would kill him. Energized, the evil type struck Hajin's staff with all his might, throwing him backwards. The boy didn't fall off his feet, landing and skidding a few meters. His gaze was absolutely cold and calm. Already at that moment, he realized that under normal circumstances, this type was no match for him. Energized, Taisung shouted to Hajin that he'd had enough of him. Gathering all the key into one fist, the prince activated the Imperial Battle Fist ability. At the same instant, he snapped out of his seat with lightning speed. Taisong hoped to attack his opponent's head as suddenly as possible and end the fight with a single blow. I'll send you to the other world, the prince shouted furiously and threw his arm out towards Hajin. However, the boy easily parried the blow with his staff. Perplexed by the failure of his attack, Taisong activated the ferocious tiger ability, saying that it would definitely work out this time. Immediately, dozens of energy lights began to appear from the prince's hands. However, all of them were also reflected by Heijin's staff. Surprised to see such polished movements from his enemy, Taisong realized that this boy had been hiding somewhere and training with the artifact. The hero remained silent and calmly parried all of his opponent's attacks. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out at H2 Ocrazed who commented, AoE healing OFCCC on our Betrayed Isekai video. Thanks for commenting. Suddenly, the prince suddenly soared into the air, energizing both of his fists, focusing on the target. The bulky man folded his palms, accumulating a charge of Kai. In flight, he thought, the stick is messing things up for now. But the new ability was going to solve that problem. Staring fiercely into his opponent's eyes, Taisong shouted that now Heijin wouldn't need his staff. The boy turned his body around for more comfort, preparing for defense. He had already decided how he would fend off this powerful attack. His eyes glared hatefully at the man he had once considered his friend. A moment later, a powerful beam of light pierced the city's evening sky. The impact cracked the surface of the roof. Looking under his feet with hatred, Taisong expected to see a breathless body at the spot he had attacked. But what he discovered shocked the bully. Hajin had blocked the prince's powerful punch with one hand without even moving. The boy stood straight with his legs apart and his staff behind his back his left arm outstretched. He easily parried Taisong's attack. Glaring furiously at his powerless opponent, the guy grabbed his palms and pulled him up to him. Turning around with his body, he threw the prince behind his back with all his might. Doing a somersault in mid-air, 
The bulky man landed on his feet and skidded, extinguishing the inertia. Looking down, Taisong wondered in horror how such a thing was even possible. How could this weakling fight him on par and moreover counterattack so confidently? Looking down on the enemy, the hero's entire aura lit up. At that moment, he said that the prince was right about one thing. With those words, Hojin stuck his staff into the ground with a clatter, crunching his fingers and lowering himself to his foe. He said with a grin that he wouldn't need a weapon in a battle with the prince. Filled with rage at the insolence of this annoying boy, Taisong waved his hand at his classmate. Heijin ironically said that he might as well give in, and Taisong shouldn't be shy. Meanwhile, Ahan was rapidly moving between the buildings towards the target. Looking around, the girl noticed a suspicious movement to her right. Following the strange shadow, the schoolgirl found herself on one of the floors of a building under construction. A little out of breath, Ahan decided to look around cautiously. Suddenly, an unknown male voice said that the stranger was walking and not looking around at all. Looking to the right, the girl saw two men in business suits. One of them said that people like the uninvited guest died quickly in this city. Opposite Ahan stood two people who looked suspiciously like each other. Both had blue hair. The schoolgirl calmly replied that she was usually more cautious, but that this was the company's neighborhood. A surprised man in a suit asked if the girl knew who they were. Taking a closer look at the intruder, the sixth chief of the royal company noted one notable detail. Behind the stranger's back hung a rather familiar sword. Jin Jun realized that it was the blade of the pure current sect leader. Realizing that her opponent had seen the sword and recognized it, Ahan said that the conversation would not be long and that she knew who she was talking to. To the sibling's surprise, the girl said that some of the strongest members of the group of nine and leaders of the five great families, the Namgung family, were now standing in front of her. Specifically, the only living members of the Namgung family, Jin Jun and Namgung Jin Ah. The female agent was surprised someone had managed to recognize her. The man, on the other hand, said it was all a meaningless pastime. With those words, Jin Jun drew his sword from its sheath and asked why the stranger had called them here. Tensely peering at the blade behind the strange girl's back, the chief ordered her to answer immediately. Ahan looked calmly at the enemy who had prepared for battle. She then replied that she was going to destroy the royal company. To the surprised looks from the Namgung siblings, the stranger immediately replied that she needed help from within to do so. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.